pronounced to be. None of our party got an opportunity to take dinner with Mr. Young, but a genteel by the name of Johnson professed to have enjoyed a sociable breakfast in the Lion House. He gave a preposterous account of the calling of the roll and other preliminaries and the carnage that ensued when the buckwheat cakes came in. But he embellished rather too much. He said that Mr. Young told him several smart sayings of certain of his two-year-olds, observing with some pride that for many years he had been the heaviest contributor in that line to one of the Eastern magazines, and that he wanted to show Mr. Johnson one of the pets that had said the last good thing, but he could not find the child. He searched the faces of the children in detail, but could not decide which one it was. Finally, he gave up with a sigh and said, I thought I would know the little cub again, but I don't. Mr. Johnson said further that Mr. Young observed that life was a sad, sad thing, because the joy of every new marriage a, a man contracted was so apt to be blighted by the, by the inopportune funeral of a less re recent bride. And Mr. Johnson said that while he and Mr. Young were pleasantly conversing in private, one of the Mrs. Youngs came in and demanded a breast pin, remarking that she had found out that he had been giving a breast pin to number six, and she, for one, did not propose to let this partiality go on without making a satisfactory amount of trouble about it. Mr. Young reminded her that there was a stranger present. Mrs. Young said that if the state of things inside the house were not agreeable to the stranger, he could find room outside. Mr. Young promised the breast pin, and she went away. But in a minute or, in a minute or two, Mrs. Young came in and demanded, <laughs> but in a minute or two, another Mrs. Young came in and demanded a breast pin. Mr. Young began to, to rem, rem, rem on, to remonstrate. Mr. Young began a remonstrance, but Mrs. Young cut him short. She said number six had got one and number eleven was promised one, and it was no use for him to try to impose on her. She hoped she knew her rights. He gave his promise, and she went. And presently three Mrs. Youngs entered in a body and opened to, on their husband a tempest of tears, abuse, and entreaty. They had heard all about number six, number 11, and number 14. Three more breast pins were promised. They were hardly gone when nine more Mrs. Youngs filed into the presence, and a new tempest burst forth and raged round about the prophet and his guest. Nine breast pins were promised, and the weird sisters filed out again, and in came 11 more, weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. Eleven promised breast pins purchased peace once more. That is a specimen, said Mr. Young. You see how it is? You see what a life I lead? A man can't be wise all the time. In a heedless moment, I gave my darling number six, excuse my calling her thus, as her other name has escaped me for the moment, a breast pin. It was only worth twenty-five dollars, that is, apparently. That was its whole cost, but its ultimate cost was inevitably bound to be a good deal more. You yourself have seen it climb up to six hundred and fifty dollars, and alas, even that is not the end, for I have wives all over this territory of Utah. I have dozens of wives, whose numbers even I do not know without looking in the family Bible. They are scattered far and wide among the mountains and valleys of my realm, and mark you, Every solitary one of them will hear of this wretched <laughs> breast pin, and every last one of them will have one or die. Number six's breast pin will cost me $2,500 before I see the end of it, and these creatures will compare the, these pins together, and if one is a shade finer than the rest, they will all be thrown on my hands, and I will have to order a new lot to keep peace in the family. Sir, you probably do, did not know it, but all the time you were present with my children, your every movement was watched by vigilant servitors of mine. If you had offered, offered to give a child a dime, or a stick of candy, or any trifle of the kind, you would have been snatched out of the house instantly, provided it could be done before your gift left your hand. Otherwise, it would be absolutely necessary for you to make an exactly similar gift 
to all my children, and knowing by experience the importance of the thing, I would have stood by and seen to it myself that you did it, and did it thoroughly. Once a gentleman gave one of my children a tin whistle. <laughs> a veritable adventure of Satan, sir, and one which I have an unmistakable horror of. And so would you if you had 80 or 90 children in your house. But the deed was done. The man escaped. I knew what the result was going to be, and I thirsted for vengeance. I ordered out a flock of destroying angels, and they hunted the man far into the fastness of the Nevada mountains. But they never caught him. I am not cruel, sir. I am not vindictive, except when sorely outraged. But if I had caught him, sir, so help me Joseph Smith, I would have locked him into the nursery till the brats whistled him to death. <laughs> by the slaughtered body of St. Parley Pratt, whom God assoil. There was never anything on this earth like it. I knew who gave the whistle to the child, but I could not make those jealous mothers believe me. They believed I did it. And the result was just with any man of reflect is just what any man of reflection could have foreseen. I had to order a hundred and ten whistles. I think we had 110 children in the house then, but some of them are off at college now. I had to order 110 of those shrieking things, and I wish I may never speak another word if we didn't have to talk on our, fi talk on our fingers entirely from that time forth until the children got tired of the whistles. <laughs> and if ever another man gives a whistle to a child of mine, and I get my hands on him, I will hang him higher than Hammond. That is the word with the bark on it. Shade of Nephi. You don't know anything about married life. I am rich, and everybody knows it. I am benevolent, and everybody takes advantage of it. I have a strong fatherly instinct, and all the foundlings are foisted on me. Every time a woman wants to do well by, by her darling, she puzzles her brain to cipher out some scheme for getting it into my hands. Why, sir, a woman could hear came here once with a child of a curious, lifeless sort of complexion. And so had the woman, and swore that the child was mine and she was my wife. And I had married her at such and such a time in such and such a place, but she had forgotten her number. And of course, I could not remember her name. Well, sir, she called my attention to the fact that the child looked like me, and really it did seem to resemble me, a common thing in the territory. And to cut the story short, I put it in my nursery, and she left, and by the ghost of Orson Hyde, when they came to wash the pain off that child, it was an engine. Bless my soul, you don't know anything about married life. It is a perfect dog's life, sir, a perfect dog's life. You can't economize. It isn't possible. I have tried keeping one set of bridal attire for all occasions, but it is of no use. First, you'll marry a combination of calico and consumption that's so thin that's as thin as a rail, and next you'll get a creature that's nothing more than a droopsy in disguise, and then you've got to eke out that bridal dress with an old balloon. That is the way it goes. And think of the wish bill. Excuse these tears. 984 pieces a week. No, sir, there is no s such a thing as economy in a family like mine. Why, just the one of them, just, why, just the one item of cradles. Think of it, and vermifuge, soothing syrup, teething rings, and papa's watches for the babies to play with, and things to scratch the furniture with, and lucifer matches for them to eat, and pieces of glass to cut themselves with. The item of glass alone would support your family, I venture to say, sir. Let me scrimp and squeeze all I can. I still can't get ahead as fast as I feel I ought to with my opportunities. Bless you, sir. At a time when I had 72 wives in this house, I groaned under the pressure of keeping thousands of dollars tied up in 72 bedsteads, when the money ought to have been out at interest. And I just sold out the whole stock, sir, at a sacrifice, and built a bedstead 7 feet long and 90 feet wide. But it was a failure, sir. I could not sleep. It appeared to me that the whole 72 women snored at once. The roar was deafening. And then the danger of it, that was what I was looking at. 
They would all draw in their breath at once, and you could actually see the walls of the house suck in, and then they would all exhale their breath at once, and you could see the walls swell out and strain and hear the rafters crack and the shingles grind together. My friend, take an old man's advice, and don't encumber yourself with a large family. Mind, I tell you, don't do it. In a small family, and in a small family only, you will find that comfort and that peace of mind which are the best at last of the blessings this world is able to afford us. And for the lack of which no accumulation of wealth and no acquisition of fame, power, and greatness can ever compensate us. Take my word for it, ten or up to eleven wives is all you need. Never go over it. Some instinct or other made me set this Johnson down as being unreliable, and yet he was a very entertaining person, and I doubt if some of the, uh, of the information he gave us could have been acquired from any other source. He was a pleasant contrast to those reticent Mormons. Chapter 16, The Mormon Bible, Proofs of Its Divinity, Plagiarism of Its Authors, Story of Nephi, Wonderful Battle, Kilcanny Cats Outdone. All men have heard of the Mormon Bible, but few except the elect have seen it, or at least taken the trouble to read it. I brought away a copy from Salt Lake. The book is a curiosity to me. It is such a pretentious affair, and yet so slow, so sleepy, such an insipid mess of inspiration. It is chloroform in print. If Joseph Smith composed this book, the act was a miracle. <laughs> Keeping awake while he did it was, at any rate. If he, according to tradition, merely translated it from certain ancient and mysteriously engraved plates of copper, which he declares he found under a stone in an out-of-the-way locality, the work of translating was equally a miracle for the same reason. The book seems to be merely a prosy detail of imaginary history with the Old Testament for a model. Put it down right there. Followed by a tedious plagiarism of the New Testament, the author labored to give his words and phrases the quaint, old-fashioned sound and structure of our King James James's translation of the scriptures. And the result is a mongrel, half modern glibness and half ancient simplicity and gravity. The latter is awkward and constrained, the former natural but grotesque by the contrast. Whenever he found his speech growing too modern, which was about every sentence or two, he ladled in a few such scriptural phrases as exceeding sore, and it came to pass, etc., and made things satisfactory again. And it came to pass was his pet. If he had left that out, his Bible would have been only 